Dave Presser will help. Yeah, yeah. William Presser Green. Hi, how are you?
but I, I didn't didn't bring or, or read the, the pick. I'm really sorry. Well, okay. I'll just well, I'll just talk about it. So we're we're on the assumption of risk, and so say if I'm in a in a grocery store and the floor is wet. But there's a sign on the floor that says wet floor. And I'm just bebopping along, minding my own, and then <laughs> into the floor I go. And I'm just down here. Yeah. That's why I don't like demonstrating torts in class, but I'm trying to keep y'all awake. Well, who's liable? Is, is it my fault? Is it the store's fault? But you be the plaintiffs over here. Y'all look like some strong plaintiff attorneys. And then that makes all my defense attorneys. And you guys back here, y'all look like a, a reasonable jury that can be swayed one way or the other. Well, who's at fault? I, I don't know. I, I don't know. Well, I never have any markers in this room. Not to worry, I always carry my own. I learned to do this when I was in the Ukraine. Uh, they actually didn't supply the markers for the teachers. And I had to go down to the old the store myself and buy my own. So now I just always keep markers. Hey, how was that meeting, everybody? Thanks. I thought we were okay for here coming in this morning. Smelling something from down there, and it ain't green buck poop. You better go see somebody. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, uh, next case. Not all that interesting, but really probably should have included it. The majority holding is not that interesting. It's a unique look at the dissent by Justice Scalia here. Now, Justice Scalia is a textualist. He believes you listen to the words that the rule says. Because if you're not going to listen to what these rules say, why even bother having the Constitution to begin with? Alright, that's our last lesson in the murder chapter. I'm very excited about rape and sexual assault. We're going to spend about two months on it. Does anybody have any questions about it? Alright, great. See y'all next week. Okay, folks, how are you doing today? I'm especially excited today. We're going to talk about Volkswagen. Yeah, personal jurisdiction. This is a great case. It's one of my favorites. Uh, I hope y'all had a great weekend. I kind of snowed in, but I wasn't complaining about that. Uh, now, now, Mr. Thompson, in the Volkswagen case, did the court have personal jurisdiction? Uh, yes. Okay, but, but why? Why? Uh, well, the court established that there was some uh, minimal contacts that were right. Right, but see, they were. They weren't concerned about the minimal contacts, but... Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't follow. It, the, it was the re reasonableness taxes, right? Oh, oh right, 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 the reasonableness. Right, right. Just, just bring reasonableness taxes from the opinion. Okay, folks, so let's, let's do some hypo. Let's see if we can steal on my, my new randomized list. Miss, Mr. Cowan, Mr. Cowan here today. Okay, so let's go to a couple hypos. Mr. Slauson, are you here? Yes, yeah, I'm ready. All right, hypo three. Uh, what's the answer right here? Uh, I think it's B. Okay, B, you're right, right, but, but why? Mm, I believe it was because they had proper subject matter jurisdiction. Mm, was it the subject matter? Uh, maybe it was personal jurisdiction. Right, okay, right, right. It, they did have the proper personal jurisdiction for the claim, okay. Okay. So today we're going to talk about the Boner case over in, uh, this is the one about the rehab facility and the 
guy playing basketball. You know, this is one of my favorite cases because, you know, I, I really like basketball. I coach a little team, and I kind of messed up once last year because, uh, you know, we, we were 0 and 4. Right? We were just bad. We just got slaughtered by every team that we played, right? And, and, and so this one kid just came up to me just crying after the game, you know, and he was just like, we're not going to win a game. And I was just like, I was like no, no. Like, we won't go through the entire season without winning a game. We're like, we're, we're going to win one. We went through the entire season, and we got slaughtered every game. And then he came up to me at the last game, crying, and said, we went the whole season without winning a game. And, you know, so, like, I felt bad. So, like, I learned my lesson from that. I will never tell a kid that we will definitely win a game ever again. <laughs> right, right. Okay, so, anyway, let's do some hypo. All right. Okay, we've got Leonard versus Petsuko. Uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Moore, Mr. Mr. Moore. Now, Lucy versus Zimmer. <coughs> really good case here. Breach a land contract. When Lucy breached, what did Mr. Zimmer do, Mr. Gutierrez? Uh, he sued. He sued. He said, "I'm mad as hell. I'm gonna sue the bastard for all his work." <coughs> All right, and now that brings us to the class Brooklyn Bridge hypothetical. <clears throat> Say you're walking across the Brooklyn Bridge and you're nine-tenths of the way across the bridge, Mr. Mordick, and all of a sudden you see good old Professor Waltzall flying in on his helicopter and he says, Revoke! Revoke! Under the classic interpretation, Mr. Martin. That contract, the author has been rescued. <clears throat> so, now, that is the classic Brooklyn Bridge hypothetical. Mr. Hackenschneider, Mr. Parson, Quantum Merowit, a nudum pactum, a naked pact. Quasi-contract. 